Welcome everybody. Um, good morning to those of you on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, guten Mittag um, für alle, die, die um, auf dieser Seite des Atlantiks sind. Welcome to everybody. It's so nice uh, to have you. This is the fourth session of the Transatlantic Virtual Event Series Road to Election Night and Beyond. And we do have a hashtag, so please follow us and feel free to tweet um, and post about us. Hashtag R2 Election Night. And it is organized and hosted by several transatlantic institutions and political foundations. Um, the Espen Institute Germany, American Academy in Berlin, MGM Germany, Atlantic Brücke, American Council on Germany, Deutsche Atlantische Gesellschaft, America House München, America House uh, Nordrhein-Westfalen, Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, Friedrich Naumann Stiftung, Heinrich Böll Stiftung, Hans Seidel Stiftung, and I am sure many are going to still join us on the way to the election night. Um, to participate, and we would like to have um, a strong participation, you are welcome to raise your hand um, and uh, to contribute with questions and comments in the Q and A section. But you can also let us know um, if you want to say something um, and participate um, directly um, in our discussion, just raise your hand. If you have joined us via telephone, then you have to dial star nine um, to dial in for participation. And as I said, this is a, going to be hopefully a very lively um, debate. I am so pleased and very honored um, to introduce our two panelist speakers today. It would be so much nicer to have you here with us, but virtually is also good. Um, this is Robert Zollick. Um, you know Robert. Um, he is, um, in German, we would say, bekannt wie ein bunter Hund. He is very, very known for what he has done in the past and his um, involvement in multilateralism, multilateral institutions. He is um, uh, the non-executive chairman of Alliance Bernstein, um, a leading global investment management firm, and he's also a senior fellow at the uh, Belfast Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. You know him as World Bank uh, Chief, you know him as USTR, you know him as Deputy Secretary of State, you know him as Counselor of the Secretary of Treasury, um, and you know him as White House Deputy Chief of Staff, some of the positions you have gone through. When I was looking up what you have all done and said with regard to multilateralism, I found one quote, which I just have to read to everybody because it is so telling. And I hope we come back to this in our discussion. Um, so I quote Robert, when I consider a problem, it is now instinctive for me to think about the institutions involved the authorizing environment, possible coalitions, likely opposition, implementation, legal issues, resource dimension, communication, and how the problem fits into a stream of other issues. And I think there are lots of problems to talk about. Robert, thank you so much for being here today. Our second panelist today is Werner Hoyer, and also he is um, very known to us. He has been serving as president of the European Investment Bank since January 1st, 2012. He started his long career, um, which brought him both to um, politics, but also to academics um, at, at Academia in the uh, University um, of Cologne, where he was an associate lecturer, professor of international economic relations. And when I looked you up, what you have done all, um, Werner, um, and it would now also be great if you turned on your, um, your camera and um, so that everybody can see you. Um, I found a quote by you, which I also found so telling. And it reads, so now I'm quoting Werner, by simply walking away from a group of cooperative people, you don't get stronger, you get lonely. We need to move away from zero sum thinking. And um, today we want to talk about multilateral institutions, multilateralism in crisis, and foremost, how we get out of this. And with this, um, I would first like to thank you for being here and then hand over the floor is yours, Robert, and then the floor is yours, Werner. So thank you very much, Stormy, for the, for the invitation. And uh, it's a pleasure to be back in Berlin, even if only virtually, 
you've got such a beautiful sky behind you. Uh, and it's always a, a privilege to be with my friend Werner. We worked together in many capacities um, when he was in the Bundestag before he moved to the European Investment Bank. And I've, I've watched with admiration uh, how he's helped lead a very important European institution. So let me open with, with, uh, with five quick points. Uh, first, in considering uh, globalization, I think it's useful to distinguish between the phenomenon of globalization and what we'll call the governance of globalization. The phenomenon is not going away. If you consider our agenda today of pandemics and biological security or climate and environment issues, uh, capital flows, migration, uh, information and data questions, um, those topics are gonna to be with us. However, I think the governance through regimes and norms and institutions has been framed or even fragmented. Second point, very important to keep in mind that multilateral institutions work for their nation state members. Nation states remain the primary actors and decision makers. So for example, if people feel that the World Health Organization, the WHO uh, is weak, it's because the nation states don't give it the power to investigate and enforce uh, some of the concerns about uh, health and, and pandemics. And the WHO offers an excellent example because in the early 2000s, as I recall, Gro Brundtland, the former prime minister of Norway was head of WHO. And she was somewhat frustrated by the lack of ability of WHO to pursue some of the concerns she had about pandemics, but the nation states didn't wanna give her uh, more authority. So <clears throat> we also need to recognize that these institutions vary a huge amount in terms of capacity, resources, decision-making, staff capacity. Third point, I think it's very important to pay attention to effectiveness and accountability as opposed to the forms of institutions. Much of the debate will talk about this aspect of participation and that aspect of participation. Those are important issues, but <clears throat> we've seen in recent years, some multilateral institutions that supposedly have a head of a different type of group, but they're not necessarily any more effective. In fact, sometimes less effective. Um, and in particular, I think it's important to look at how the institutions interact together. And this is a, uh, a critical issue, particularly for the, the EIB, Werner would know this well, but let me give you a, some real life examples. The WHO has some great expertise. It has some useful networks, particularly in the developing world, but it has limited capacity. <clears throat> it's not really a field organization. So in trying to deal with the pandemic in the developing world, it really needs partners. So one of the issues that I identified for this week, since it's the annual meetings of the IMF and World Bank, is how the World Bank in particular and the regional development banks should be able to partner with the World Health Organization in, developing work, uh, in the developing world when it comes time to distributing vaccines. This will be a huge issue of logistics, refrigeration, cold storage, supply chains, uh, working with national healthcare systems, having the trust of community health groups. And the WHO doesn't have that capacity all by itself. And if I would draw an analogy, at the time of the global financial crisis, we also had a surge in world food prices. And I was at the World Bank at that point, and I worked very closely with the UN agencies some of which had field operations, but some of which needed the broader support of links to development uh, ministries and finance ministries and other topics. And that should be more common. Um, again, in, when thinking about the global climate change issue, uh, there should be a key question about financing, particularly in the developing world. So at the time I was able to raise about seven or $8 billion uh, for climate investment funds which we then leveraged uh, with additional funds to 50 or $60 billion. And the idea was we would use these funds as pilots to experiment with different types of ideas that would support the commitments that nation states make. And so 
one needs to think about how these institutions continue to adjust and innovate. I mean, the IMF started with a world of fixed exchange rates, and now it's obviously a floating rate system. You have a whole different set of players, particularly with developing uh, world countries. Fourth, um, I view multilateral uh, institutions as part of a larger network. Obviously, there's governments. So in my case at the World Bank, I often dealt with aid and development ministries. But there's also the private sector. And here I'm talking about both profit and nonprofit organizations. So for example, in the World Health Organization, while the US is pulled out, the second largest funder is the Gates Foundation. And you'll see this uh, across uh, different institutions, whether it be nonprofit or profit-making companies. Um, when I was working on the uh, genocide in Darfur in 2005 and 2006, I had to partner quite closely with humanitarian groups and they were of different types. Some of the NGOs were focusing on uh, supplying humanitarian needs to these huge camps. Some of them were more of an advocacy group. And so you, one needs to see how these institutions fit within a larger network. In the environmental space, there are a number of conservation groups. But when I launched an initiative at the World Bank to try to expand the 3,500 tigers left in the world, the conservation groups were great supporters but we needed the scientific community, we needed finance ministries, we went to the heads of government. And that's a role that sometimes the development institutions can play that the conservation groups could not alone. So you have to think about these as partnership issues. Uh, fifth, when I was uh, at the State Department in 2005, I gave a speech uh, on China saying that China had been well integrated in the system, but it needed to become a responsible stakeholder. And what I was trying to make the point was that by 2005, China was a member of the uh, UN Security Council. It was a, uh, in the IMF, the World Bank, uh, uh, sort of treaties from ozone depletion to others at WTO. And the question is whether China would step up to assume some of the responsibility of the international system as well as benefit from it. I mean, sad to say, I think we're in an environment now where neither China nor the United States is acting as responsible stakeholders in the system. And so you're seeing some fragmentation, um, but the system doesn't, uh, doesn't just stop and wait. So I was explaining to Stormy, I was, uh, last night, my time, I was on a, uh, a video conference with people in East Asia. And you will see that you know, even as the United States and China joust, others in the region will move forward. They'll come up with different arrangements. They may not be as efficient. Uh, uh, they may be uh, more complex. Uh, they may be workarounds, but people have to deal with those issues that I identified as being part of, of globalization in, in one form or another. And I'll close with this thought. Um, this fabric that we've created, this set of networks of institutions, private, public, multilateral. Um, they're, they're an effort to try to avoid uh, the model that we had, say, in 1900, where it was simply a world of great power competition. And if we let this system come apart, you could return to that world. You could, it would be a different set of actors. It'd be China, the United States, uh, India, the European Union, certainly on economic and, and political issues, a question whether uh, it would have a cohesive security and foreign policy. Japan would try to find a relationship with both the United States and China. Russia, by reason of its size and energy resources and geographic position. But that's a very different world than we've gotten to use and be comfortable in over the past uh, 70 years or so. And so I think we ought to be careful about trying to uh, maintain what we have, but also adapt it for future circumstances. Thank you so, so very much um, for these introductory words. Let me um, ask one question before I turn it over to Werner. Um, here, here in Germany, multilateralism seems to be almost in our DNA. We don't so much question if the multilateral way is the best way. We just assume that everybody believes this. And we often do not pitch it. Um, so what would you tell us? How, in a short pitch, would we or should we pitch multilateralism to our colleagues over on the other side um, of the Atlantic in Washington? 
Well, the German perspective, and to a degree, the European perspective, um, is a function of your history. Um, and obviously, uh, there's a sensitivity actually to nationalism or the role of the nation state. What I would suggest to you is it, it, the starting point is to understand that actually Europe is the outlier on this. <laughs> is that whether it's the United States or Russia or China or East Asian countries, they're quite sensitive to their sovereignty and sense of independence. And just to give you a, a practical example, in the case of the European Union, uh, people discuss the shared sovereignty. When the United States and Canada and Mexico created a North American trading system, um, all three partners are quite uh, sensitive to their sovereignty and independence. So it was a challenge of creating integration with respect for sovereignty and independence, in part because uh, in the 19th century, the United States had taken about a third of Mexico in war, and there was always the tension uh, with Canada because of the different sizes. So I think trying to understand that perspective is the starting point. And then uh, I think there's a need, as I tried to do uh, today, to emphasize what are the commonality of interests? How will you deal with biological security? And so we're not only dealing with today's pandemic, but I was on a conference call with one of the world's leading virologists a few weeks ago, and he said, we have about five of these viruses a year that could become uh, pandemics and they're not going away. So how do we try to learn from this experience, try to create precautions, respond better? Certainly that's gonna be true on environment and climate issues. Certainly it's, and, and even on the broader development agenda, which Europe knows well, if Sub-Saharan Africa is unsuccessful in its development, then one better expect migration. Um, so I think it's a, it's a, at the end of the day, I wouldn't approach these issues as charity uh, because while charity would reflect good intentions and good feelings, when countries under pressure, pressure uh, they, could, they could recede on that. I think it's important to emphasize the mutual self-interest. Thank you very much. And with this, um, I hand over to Werner. Did we learn from the crisis? Is there more appetite for multilateralism now? I'm looking forward to your perspective. Thank you very much, Stormy, and uh, thank you very much for that question that uh, brings me directly to the point. I believe indeed that we have learned during these last eight months that we better return to the good ex experiences that we have made with multilateralism. I come back to this in a minute. Let me first of all, thank you very much for this invitation to this fascinating uh, event. And uh, let me thank you particularly for getting me together again with Bob Zellick. I mean, the last event where we appeared together, I think was three and a half years ago in the spring meeting in Washington, uh, when we discussed multilateralism and since then, a lot has happened and the threat to multilateralism uh, has not left us, but has been rather accentuated by protectionism and populism. Um, today, more than ever, so much is at stake. COVID-19 has shown us that we cannot think anymore in terms of borders and uh, barriers to protect ourselves. It has exposed the weaknesses of nationalism and protectionism while highlighting the central vital importance of joint action, cooperation, dialogue, in one word, multilateralism. In Europe, we know what we are talking about because we made the mistakes at the beginning of this pandemic. The initial response to the crisis in many places in Europe was nothing less but catastrophic. Border controls, entry stops, export bans on medical protective equipment and things like that. The first reflex in many member states, including Germany, was to reach into the instrument box of the nation state. The consequence, massive economic disruptions and an estrangement between the people of Europe not seen in a long time. A new Facebook group for an Italexit attracted within just a few weeks more than 850,000 followers in Italy. While the health benefits of such a unilateral moves move was of course at best negligible. So over time, we have developed pan-European responses that better reflect the interconnectedness of our economies and, and the solidarity of the European Union, but the experience of the first weeks should remain with us as a lesson for what happens if you don't work together. Um, global action is necessary not only for COVID-19, 
It's let's not forget the longer term objectives of our institutions now that we enter the decade of action to meet the sustainable development goals and to respond to the challenges posed by the climate change. Uh, I take a point that Bob just made, the uh, interconnection and uh, interaction between multilateral institutions and organizations. Uh, we have been very much uh, connected to the United Nations organizations in the context of the development of the sustainable development goals. Well, you cannot ever finance these, the achievement of the sustainable development goals by budget, public budgetary money alone. We need to draw in the private sector into this. We need to mobilize the private sector for public policy purposes. And that's what we do very, very closely. We, we have established at our institution a very close relationship with the Secretary General of the United Nations and his sub-organizations from, from UNICEF to WHO and what have you, because we indeed believe that we put, should bring in our capacities into the service of uh, the multilateral institutions on the other side and uh, into the pursuit of global public policy goals. And uh, since uh, we are the biggest uh, multilateral promotional and development bank, I think we have to set a standard there in order to uh, bring us closer to the SDGs. For me, this is one of my main uh, main objectives. The climate is, of course, one of them. And for us, at the Climate Bank of the EU, now priority number one. But we must not forget that we, on, on water projects, on education, on health, we need this interaction of the multilateral institutions um, in the context of the United Nations organization and in other than, than regional contexts. And that, of course, means that for the multilateral financing institutions, it would be total nonsense to see ourselves as competitors instead of uh, collaborators, because we as the EU bank, we never project a, a finance a project alone. We always uh, need at least for 50% of the investment sum partners who cooperate with us and co-finance with us. So we are totally open to, the, uh, to an extension of the cooperation and collaboration of the multilateral institutions. Um, if I also may ask you a question, um, because you refer to the cooperation among the multilateral organizations, and you said that there has to be cooperation. Um, are you implying that there is not enough cooperation right now? And if so, how could that be strengthened on such important issues as climate change um, or also epidemic uh, preparedness and uh, fighting epidemics? Well, I think we have a lot of cooperation and uh, it is so successful in my view that it should be expanded. Uh, sometimes you have political, uh, politically very sensitive areas like climate change or the fight against climate change, where you are also dependent upon your shareholders. And if you have strong shareholders who believe that climate change is a bluff, then it's difficult to mobilize that institution on the fight against climate change. We are in the lucky situation as the European Investment Bank that we have only one consistent set of shareholders. These are the member states of the European Union, which, by the way, is the reason why, unfortunately, we lost Great Britain as uh, one of the, the key shareholders of, of the bank recently. But we are an exclusively EU bank, and that makes it a little bit easier to arrive at policy conclusions. So, so Stormy, let me, let me give you a practical example of this uh, from, from my tenure. Um, when, when I was at the World Bank, uh, I would meet regularly with the heads of the Inter-American Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank, uh, the European Bank uh, for Reconstruction and, and Development, um, and the African Development Bank. And uh, we tried to compare notes, and, and one day uh, we discovered that uh, all of us uh, have procedures for participating companies that might violate our rules. And what we, we would do then, we sanction it. But what we discovered is that the World Bank might find company A that has violated the rules and it would have a sanction, but the Asian Development Bank would continue to do business with it. So we did a cross-sanctioning arrangement to try to deal with those that are engaged in violating rules uh, or corruption. On the financial side, um, some of the regional development banks, because their loans were to their region, uh, had a risk concentration. 
And so uh, we worked with the Inter-American Development Bank to actually have some loans exchanged so as to uh, allow them to continue the lending, but create a different risk diversification profile to help them in terms of maintaining their, their, their bond rating. Um, when it came time to uh, trying to help various countries set up anti-corruption efforts, this really moved into the area of how they can develop the institutions, the prosecutors, the judges, other aspects. And there's a lot of, of learning that can be shared. And frankly, it's just moral support for some of these brave people taking on uh, some of these topics. So the, 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 the possibilities of interaction can go on and on. And, and Werner made a very key point. Um, you know, while the World Bank in a significant year may do, oh, you know, 50, 60 billion dollars across its different investment funds, private sector funds for the poorest, general bank lending. That's a drop in the bucket in international capital markets. So you have to try to think about how you can leverage that money or create, in a sense, models of demonstration that you can expand to other countries. Um, and again, in the area of, of safety net policy, actually Mexico had begun something called conditional cash transfers, which was the idea that you would give money uh, cash funds directly to the poorest 10 or 15% if they send the children to school and the women got health checkups, probably did more for health of women in Mexico than anything in the country's history. Um, and the Inter-American Development Bank had helped with that. Well, we, we looked at the, the project and by the time I left the World Bank, we had uh, expanded that to some 45 other countries. And, and what was, and, and actually it's been quite significant in some of the safety net support you see in some of the Latin American countries today with the pandemic. And it was, it was quite efficient. It was for about a half or 1% of GDP, you'd protect the bottom 15%. Now, what was interesting about that was when it came time to share the experience, for example, with Egypt, as we did, um, we didn't just give them uh, the textbook and explain how it was done. We could connect them with the people in Mexico or later in Brazil, the Bolsa Familia program to show the practice of this. So again, I think the point that I was trying to emphasize, Stormy, is sometimes the discussions of multilateralism are sort of a a plea for good intentions and goodwill. And that's all well and good. But what I'm trying to emphasize is at the end of the day, producing things, effectiveness, building signs on support. And part of the talent for, for running these institutions is not only running your own institution, but how you connect it with others. And here I compliment Werner. I mean, it's part of his European experience from different dimensions, but he's looked to see how the EIB can be a catalyst for action uh, across uh, the European states. If I, if I may um, ask one last question to both of you before I turn it to the many questions which are already filing up um, from our audience. I heard both of you referring to the members um, of international organizations and that there are still states behind this. And I don't know if it's an urban moose, but I heard um, so many times that there was one time a former uh, WTO director who had a picture in his office with a car um, and that car had crashed into a wall and there were several people sitting in the car and it said below the car, I mean, in the throat below that picture, it said, member driven car. So is it the members who are really the problem? Um, and if so, um, should maybe the international organizations giving more power to act? For example, the GMF has just done a transatlantic uh, high leadership um, uh, initiative and they are recommending for the WTO that the secretariat should get more power in comparison to the member states. Werner, how would you see that? Should the should the organizations be more of an actor themselves and get more power vis-a-vis -vis the member states? Of course, that temptation might be there. But on the other hand, as a 25-year parliamentarian, I would say, let's look at, the, um, at the, the role of the institutions and the role of elected people. I mean, we need to have also the legitimacy coming from the vote of the people, at least in Western countries, enlightenment-based rule of law uh, following democratic societies. 
And that means uh, they, the member states and their elected officials have a say, must have a say, that's clear. But I think we all should encourage them also to embark more on the multilateral uh, boat, because uh, that is obviously helpful. If I go back to the first years when, when Bob and I had to do with one another, that was when, when he was one of the key persons in the context of German unification around 1990. I mean, at that time, we discovered the wealth that multilateralism could bring to us. And at that time, it was exploited to the maximum, I think. And we have a little bit moved away from that, not because the institution would want it, but uh, of course, the the, uh, the attractiveness of multilateral uh, approaches for some member states and their politicians has obviously receded. And I think we should convince them to go back to this very, very good experience of the 90s. So Stormy, uh, I, I, would, I would add just a bit to that. I, I think, it's important to dig into the details of each institution. Mm -hmm. And uh, my good friend, Pascal Lamy, who had been the European Commissioner for Trade, became the head of the WTO. And I think uh, he and I would agree that as president of the World Bank, I had greater authority to initiate projects, and I'm sure Werner does too, than the Director General of the WTO does. The Director General of the WTO is, has a, quite a limited role. And, um, and I think that's worth scrutinizing. As, as Werner emphasizes, you can't go too far in this because you'll lose the support of the institutions. But um, there, there can be, I mean, one of the challenges uh, for many of these institutions is they have on-site boards or ambassadors. And sometimes that can become a rather closed click. And this, I think, has actually hurt the WTO over the past years. You have ambassadors who are trade specialists. They kind of, they're used to the maneuvering and kind of uh, the tactical aspects. And frankly, they've lost sight that the WTO will, will, its role in the world trading system will be undermined unless it makes adaptations. And so you've got, a, you've got a debate going on right now about the new head of the WTO. One of the senior candidates who Europe has supported is Ngozi Akanjo Wela, my former colleague uh, at the World Bank and in other institutions. And I think part of the appeal that she brought was that um, she uh, is, is not a formal trade person. She's somebody who's operated in the political world. She's operated in finance and business. And uh, I think some of the member states are looking to see what perspective, that sort of broader perspective. But at the end of the day, it's still going to require, in a sense, bringing people on side. So again, let's take the WHO as an example. You know, um, and, and this is where, it was, as people debate kind of the qualities of leadership, in some ways, and, and Werner's a good representative of this, some, some diplomatic knowledge is actually a useful skill. So the head of the WHO is put in this difficult situation. The virus starts in China. He needs the information from China. China is wary. Um, and so in my view, he probably went a little too far in praising China's cooperation, but he was trying to do it because he wanted to get some help from China. But in a way, uh, part of the challenge of leading those organizations is you know, uh, encouraging their support, but not undermining your own legitimacy as a, as a independent player. So again, you know, when I was at the World Bank, obviously I'm an American, uh, and I had to be sensitive to the role of the United States as a shareholder, but now and then I took different positions and I would argue different positions than the government did, whether it was the Bush administration or the Obama administration. I had to pick my shots. I couldn't just do that gratuitously, but in doing so, I was trying to demonstrate that I was representing a multilateral institution, not the United States. This will also be an issue, by the way, in that Look, I've been a person that's encouraged Chinese participation in these institutions. But, you know, if as a representative, if you're a Chinese uh, member of the Communist Party and you basically see your allegiance to Beijing, well, it's going to raise questions in the minds of others. That's a challenge that the Chinese will have to face. Um, that's great that you um, mentioned Chinese, just Ch China, just in, the, in your last sentence, because that brings me to our first question. Um, Heinrich, Heinrich Kreft, who is himself a China um, expert um, and uh, from the foreign, from our foreign ministry, um, is asking why China actually did not become a responsible actor 
in multilateral organizations. It looked so promising in the beginning. And then there seemed to be a turning point um, and our hopes have not been fulfilled. Werner, what do you think? Why, why, why didn't China become a responsible actor so far? I, I wouldn't go that far, but I would say that uh, obviously national strategic deliberations sometimes supersede multilateral convictions. Uh, when we operate on concrete cases with China, or in this case, uh, the newly established Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, then it is very, very fruitful and reliable. But you always know, in view of the allegiances that all the key leaders they have when they are of it, if and when they are of Chinese nationality, that there is a, a final emergency break that might be drawn all of a sudden. And this makes it different to uh, other institutions where at least theoretically, the members of the board or the members of the management committee or so uh, are required according to the statute and by the statutes to serve the interests of the institution and not the interests of their, their home country. Uh, sometimes I, I admit it's a little bit theoretical, but sometimes I have to uh, remind my own board members of this fact. They are not representing the interests of, of their, their home countries, but the interests of the institution. And this is extremely more difficult for a representative job from China in view of the political establishment there. So Stormy, this is a very good question. And pardon me, I'm gonna take a, a few minutes to address it because I think the story is somewhat mixed. So as, as, as Werner emphasized, uh, a man named Jin LeQuin was appointed the head of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And uh, actually the Obama administration opposed it. I thought it was a mistake to do so uh, because you know, in many years in US government service, I'd had countries always saying things that they wanted the US to do and have the US pay for. And I wasn't against the idea of China financing infrastructure if they did it with appropriate standards and governance and procurement rules and environmental rules and others. And Jin LeQuin did exactly that. In fact, he hired a bunch of people who used to work with me at the World Bank to help set his standards. And frankly, because his staff is thin, he's doing a lot of co-financing with, with uh, the other international uh, financial institutions. Now, let me connect that to Belt and Road. Uh, when I was invited in China for the 40th anniversary of the launch of the reforms, in my address, I said, you know, um, no one knows what Belt and Road is. Is it a geopolitical venture? Is it a development plan? Is it to use excess capacity? It's probably all those things. But I said, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. So I urged the Chinese to look at the AAIB experience. And I said, this has been well received internationally. Why don't you apply it to Belt and Road? Why don't you try to have governance standards, anti-corruption, procure open procurement, environmental conditions? And uh, one of the Chinese leading officials said, look, we've shared your remarks with President Xi. The next year when President Xi spoke at the forum for the Belt and Road, he adopted a lot of those principles. Now, the problem at that point was, I think it would have been wise for other countries to engage China and say, well, we're pleased you've accepted these principles. How can we make sure? How can we have transparency? How can we monitor them? How can we know that you're sort of following through? Now, would everything have been great? Yeah, no, but you undoubtedly would have improved the situation. And to give you an example of something that's quite current today, in the same speech, I warned China that it was a lot of the loans it was making to developing countries had the possibility that they were gonna go bad. And I said, but your, your loan portfolio is very opaque. I said, at some point, this is gonna become a problem and people will knock at your door and they'll wanna know kind of whose loans and with what country. I urge them to try to get ahead of it, be more transparent. And that's exactly one of the issues that you're dealing with now in the pandemic. You know? Now, part of the, my point to this is not to just point fingers at, at Beijing. I think Beijing will work on a lot of those issues, but if they are kind of, uh, if, you, if you indict them before you discuss it, guess what? They're gonna resist the process, similar with trying to understand the cause of the pandemic. So I think more generally, one of the problems about uh, uh, the assessment in the United States of China is there's a belief that cooperation with China failed. And that is factually just totally incorrect. I mean, if you look at the changes in their proliferation policy about nuclear weapons and missiles, I mean, they used to be, we used to fight with China in, in Korea. 
they had surrogates in North Vietnam and North Korea uh, from 2000 to I think 2018 or uh, they had uh, 190 UN Security Council resolutions, 182 uh, China agreed with the United States, often requiring diplomacy. Uh, when I was in Darfur and dealing with that issue, I actually got the Chinese to be of support. And if you think on the economic topic, China used to have a 10% current account surplus. It went down about to zero. It's come back up a little bit. So it was that was adding domestic demand. It stopped manipulating its, its exchange rate. Certainly for Germany and for the United States, it was the fastest growing export destination for 15 years. In the global financial crisis, China had a much bigger stimulus than Europe did. Um, and so one has to be fair in recognizing that not all is well, um, but, and the real message there is that the work of diplomacy never stops. But if you base your policy going forward on the idea that cooperation with China is impossible, you're gonna end up in a bad position because uh, A, it's factually incorrect and B, how are you gonna deal with pandemics or climate or economic growth without engaging China? Well, thank you so much. Uh, Werner, could you also say um, a few words on the Belt and Road Initiative? Because one of our participants was particularly interested in how we should deal with the Belt and Road Initiative. Well, I, I couldn't contradict uh, Bob on, on this issue. Uh, rejecting the Chinese instead of uh, inviting them, I think is a big mistake. And inviting them here means that when we negotiate projects in the context of the Belt and Road Initiative, you begin with defining your own interests and objectives. And then you compare them with the Chinese objectives and interests. And if you find common ground, then nothing speaks against doing it together. And this is what we are trying. It's not always easy. It's sometimes cumbersome, but in some cases it works very, very well. So uh, sometimes we, we Europeans, and sometimes in particular those Europeans who are so much in, in love with multilateralism, forget to define their own interests at the beginning of the process. That's a mistake. That doesn't give you the respect of your negotiation partner. But once you have done that and you arrive at an equilibrium of interests and, and uh, objectives, I think you can work very well with China. Thank you so much for these clear words. Um, whenever we do our to-do list, a lot of time we write ASAP as soon as possible. And one of our participants, um, uh, Johannes Allefeld, he is asking with all those ASAPs in multilateralism, all those to-dos, where should we start? Where should we put the greatest emphasis on in the beginning? Um, and I would like to start with you again, Werner. Where would you start? Oh, what a question. I mean, uh, you would have the tendency to try to start everywhere. But uh, I think after the experiences of, of the last 30 years, which to a large extent Bob and I shared, uh, I must say that trust building is the most important part of the whole thing. And a lot of trust has been lost. And therefore initiatives to uh, build trust again can be very, very helpful. Co-financing is a trust building measure by the way, but also what Bob has alluded to it, not necessarily now to China, but it's not impossible in the future either, uh, swap, uh, portfolio swaps. Well, we did portfolio swaps with, with, with the World Bank when the World Bank was overexposed post in country X, instead of in country being very strong in country nine, then we took over part of the World Bank portfolio so that uh, the World Bank could do more on the, on the country Y. So these are cooperation schemes that can be extremely useful. And I don't see why that should not be useful between uh, in the cooperation between the World Bank and AIIB or the EI, EIB at AIIB. Uh, I think we, we must be a little bit more creative and move towards one another. Presently, the situation everywhere, whether it's the European Council or the Foreign Affairs Council or the Environment Council, wherever I go, uh, I see that in times of, of uh, teleconferences only, you don't arrive at confidence building procedures and measures. So we must overcome this present situation and, and also establish personal relations again that make it possible to trust one another. And Bob, your ASAPs? Well, um, it reminds me in, in 1981, when President Reagan was elected, my former boss, James Baker, was the chief of staff. And he said, Mr. President, you have three priorities. 
economic recovery, economic recovery, and economic recovery. <laughs> and, and I think um, as we move into 2021, um, for both uh, the United States, but the world at large, the priority will be on dealing with the pandemic with inclusive economic recovery. So the two have to be seen as interconnected here. Um, and um, I think that uh, in a sense, we're, as we were discussing before with the program, you know, we're, we've had a rebound, we haven't had a full recovery and recovery partly depends on restoring confidence of consumers, businesses, uh, investors. Um, as, as I think Werner mentioned, there's been a lot of loss of trust in citizens and his point on trust is one that I emphasize whether it's for companies or governments. As we start to get better treatments and we hope vaccines, this is gonna be a huge challenge about how these are rolled out, how to bring people on board, um, how to engage the developing countries uh, in this process as well. The nature of a pandemic is if you deal with it just in one country, you're not gonna solve the problem. So I think that would, and as I suggested in my opening remarks, this is an opportunity that has dimensions obviously in health, but also on the development side um, and uh, the systems to do so. And I'd even connect it, uh, as I alluded to, to wildlife trafficking. We we're gonna learn a lot about how viruses spread on this on the environmental side. So I think that will be the political test for leaders. Um, but to connect this to the broader uh, US-European relationship, let me get to go one step further. If Biden is elected, he's gonna have a huge agenda. He's got pandemic, great healthcare system, he's got uh, inclusive economic growth, he's got racial issues, he's got environmental issues, he's got immigration issues. And you are all sophisticated watchers of the US system. There's only so much you can get done in, in our governmental system uh, at once. So you do have to set priorities. And, uh, and recall, you had President Carter, Clinton and Obama all elected with democratic congresses and they suffered serious reversals after two years because of this, this challenge. So I think on the one hand, you have to expect that a Biden administration will have to focus on these domestic issues. But I think there's an opportunity to leverage this internationally, including in rebuilding alliance ties. So what I've argued in a piece in the Foreign Affairs Online was to say, if you do something uh, at home with vaccines and pandemic, connect it to your international agenda. So don't just rejoin the WHO, but make an initiative like I mentioned with the development banks, or maybe as President Bush 43 did, you have a huge agenda as he launched this HIV AIDS program and malaria and tuberculosis. So um, if you do something on climate change, uh, on carbon, you don't just rejoin the Paris Accord, you try to work to bring developing countries in support. So soil carbon is a promising area to absorb carbon, but also could help African agriculture, avoided forestation and deforestation. We're certainly gonna need different sort of adaptation strategies. If you do something on immigration connected with a different policy towards Mexico. Mm -hmm. And what I'm suggesting by this is, is that in some ways it fits into this, the multilateral topic. That is actually a pretty good agenda to start to rebuild ties with your European and Asian partners, as well as the challenging issues of, of data and cybersecurity and traditional security concerns of nuclear weapons and regional dangers. <laughs> Um, but so there is a way that you can connect your, your demanding domestic agenda with your international agenda. So um, it, what I'm trying to give for the answer to the question is to see that while I think pandemic and economic recovery will be the first priority, I think it would be wise uh, to rebuild our partnerships because the two biggest issues we're going to face ultimately are the future of free societies and how to deal with China. And I think in a sense, the lesson of the past 70 years is that while the US and Europe and Asian partners are not gonna be in complete alignment, the more that they approach this from a common position, the better off we'll all be. Um, Bob, you are always already anticipating my next question and building the answer into your answer. It's a great lead over though, because this wouldn't be an event vote to election if our participants wouldn't be interested in what is going to happen under a possible President Biden or another four years of President Trump. There are tons, I mean, several of the questions um, ask about the different scenarios. 
What is going to happen with regard to Iran under the two presidents? What is going to happen, uh, two possible presidents? What is going to happen with regard to Russia? What is going to happen with regard to the WHO, the WTO? What is going to happen with the transatlantic relationship? So I give it back to both of you, um, starting with Werner. Um, how are you preparing for the two different scenarios and what are you, yeah, what are you preparing for? What are you expecting? Well, we have to, to respect the vote of the American people. And of course, I have my preferences, but we have to live with what comes out of it. Uh, what is key for us is that to put it in a very simple sentence, we want the partnership with the US back. And I don't care which president organizes it. We, we need the United States in order to preserve the basic idea of what we used to call the West, enlightened rule of law based democracies, democratic societies. And uh, this is what is, is of key importance. Some of the issues, issues we have on the table right now, pandemic being probably the, the key one together with climate, is we, we will be successful only if Europe and the United States and some others in this world are able to act together. I mean, I'm, I'm really worried about the, the context between the pandemic and development. If and when we in the Northern world hopefully might be able one day to cope with this terrible challenge a little bit better than so far, then this virus will only just reach the slums of some big cities in the Southern world. And then we'll have a, we, we develop into a South-North confrontation, which is enormous. This will be able to be contained only in a multilateral context. And this is why we must enable ourselves to cooperate in these multilateral contexts again. And this will not happen if the United States and uh, Europe uh, work in, walk into different directions. Uh, well, I've already voted, so I've, <laughs> I've, I've done my uh, contribution. Um, and, I, and I think, as you, as you said, Stormy, my, my earlier comments suggested uh, an approach here. Um, I think what is important to recognize is that, um, again, if, if a Biden's elected, um, the, the demands on his time to deal with the domestic agenda are going to be significant. Uh, he's an experienced congressional politician, so in some ways he's got uh, the skills, uh, if the opposition works with him, to do as much as anyone since Linda Johnson, but it's going to limit his time internationally, and that's why I was trying to come up with an idea, a, a set of ideas that could leverage what he does domestically with the international context. I, I would have, I, I agree very much with Werner's point, and I, I wrote a piece actually the Wall Street Journal a couple of weeks ago, because what's striking is um, in the global financial crisis, and Werner will recall this, the, the developing world actually provided an extra engine of growth. Um, now um, it's, uh, we're facing in some parts of the world, what could be a decade of stagnation for education and other issues. The health effects so far have not been quite as deep uh, as some worried in part probably because of the youthfulness of population. But if you think about the economic effects, remittances, tourism, sort of other breakdowns, um, it's quite risky and quite dangerous. And uh, from a financial point of view, what you saw is because central banks have put a lot of money out, uh, there's been a lot of financing that, have, that has still supported emerging markets. But if you have a shock in the system, as you easily could, that money will flow out very, very quickly. So this is actually, I think, a prime issue uh, today. But my, my, I'll come back to my core point, Stormy, which is, say, in the trade agenda, um, pardon the sort of American colloquialism, but you need to put points on the board. You need to get some successes. You don't, you know, let's not try to change the whole world at once here. Um, <clears throat> and I can see, for example, in the WTO, without getting too complicated with you, you know, obviously the United States should rejoin the appellate mechanism, but there, if there could be some adjustments in what are called the safeguard rules to make it a little easier when industries are under pressure to have them have some temporary protection. Um, that will probably help deal with the politics of this over time. Um, if you, I, frankly, I think you're going to need to integrate the environmental health uh, and digital agendas much more closely. Um, a Biden administration, 
uh, will have difficulty on trade. And even though Democratic voters now seem more pro-trade, the constituencies in the Congress tend to have been protectionist. And the Trade Promotion Authority actually expires next year. So this will be a hard one for them. And I think this is where it'll be important to watch the appointment. If the US Trade Representative is somebody who just sort of wants to stand pat, nothing will happen as in the first Obama term. Um, if on the other hand, you have somebody who is somewhat entrepreneurial and tries to create a new coalition of, of green and trade issues, sort of like the Austrian government and as discussed in Germany, uh, well, you know, maybe this, this creates ability to build a different set of coalition. So you know, I'm always on the outlook for whether you can find a way to advance the agenda, get some success and sort of rebuild some of the confidence in these institutions. And here, I just, I wanna underscore Werner's point. We're in an environment, whether it's governments or multilateral institutions, where trust has been severely eroded. And, uh, and there's a certain discussion in the international community about, um, you know, well, how we need sort of this representation or broader discussions and participation. Well, I'm not against any of that, but at the end of the day, I wanna make sure we do some things because I think that's the way you build trust. And Bob did it again. He anticipated my next question, asking about or saying something about coalitions. And that's my, um, unfortunately, we are almost coming to an end, but many of our participants ask about coalitions. Are there still coalitions of the willing for multilateralism? And who are they? Where are they, Werner? Who is I our think coalition of the willing? I think this is st oh, still an option that is on the table and we should exploit it. But that means that those of us who are multi multilateralists like myself should also be open to review our multilateral rules sometimes. Not everything that is cast in concrete there is perfect. So we have to be also a little bit self-critical and see that what needs to be changed. Are the WTO rules always fair, for instance, or different institutions have the same, the same question? And the also we must ask ourselves, when we criticize, for instance, the, the US government, uh, are they always wrong and we are always right? Or should we take into consideration, for instance, that the expectations concerning burden sharing in, in, the, in, the, in the North Atlantic Alliance has been an issue of the Obama administration already, and it would be naive to assume that in the Biden administration that would not come back. So let's be a little bit more humble, self-critical, but go for the multilateral way. Go believe in what the classical economists have taught us about the, the value of um, division of labor in the world. Thank you, Bob. So I'm gonna give you a surprising answer, but it, yeah, I think you'll find it amusing. So the way I tried to make my contribution on this, since I'm outside of, of government or the public sector, uh, is that um, the current head of the IMF, uh, Christine Luna Georgieva, uh, was a close colleague of mine at the World Bank, whose career I tried to promote. I've mentioned the possibility that Ngozi uh, Akanja Wela, another close colleague, uh, may be in position to head uh, the WTO. Uh, another colleague from the World Bank, uh, Inger Anderson, now runs uh, UNEP, and I'm very proud of, of her record. Another colleague, uh, Vera Sangwe from Cameroon, runs the UN Commission on Africa. And uh, my former chief of staff runs a private development institution called PACT, Carolyn Anstey. So I made my contribution by trying to help five women move into advanced positions in the multilateral world. And so I'll just watch them as they succeed. Oh, that is so, so very, very <laughs> wonderful. Um, let, me, uh, let me conclude with asking one last question to you. So sometimes it feels like we also have different views on what multilateralism is. So I want to ask you in a concluding word, Three adjectives, what multilateralism is for you in three adjectives. Who would like to start? Uh, <laughs> I would begin, if, if you may, uh, and say you, you need to have a constructive mindset if you want to succeed in multilateralism. You must have a sense of fairness and you must be able to engage in a dialogue. Wonderful, thank you so much. Great pitch, Bob. 
Well, I wish I recalled more of my German because as I recall, German is a wonderful language for combining more words into one, <laughs> cheat. Um, but but um, I would focus on uh, results through cooperation and, and mutual. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, our time is already over. This has been an extremely pleasant debate. Um, we know that debates don't have to be this way. They can be very, very different. Um, and you two have made it so easy for me um, as a moderator um, to, um, to talk to you and talk with you about multilateralism, our ASAPs, what we have to do, and the way out of the crisis. Thank you so much for our audience chipping in with so many um, interesting questions. Um, I'm sorry that I had to bundle a lot of them due to time constraints, but this is not the last time we are meeting. This is to be continued. There are many more events under road uh, to elections coming up in the next days and weeks. Um, and then we all stay tuned for the results of the elections. And I hope to see both of you again hopefully in person next time. Thank you so much for your time and for sharing your wisdom and experience with us. Um, it has been really a great pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tommy. Thank you very much, Bob. Bye-bye. Keep up Thank the good so work, Bernie.